Hi. Uh, thanks for coming to talk. Uh, first of all, can everyone hear me okay? It's like wave at the back, you know? Cool. Okay. Uh, so I'm Emma. Um, I am uh, the lead Python developer at uh, Cambridge Medical Robotics. Uh, we're a startup uh, working on uh, developing the next generation uh, in robotics for keyhole surgery. Um, that is pretty much as cool as it sounds, to be honest. Um, that is pretty much uh, as cool a job as it sounds, to be honest. So uh, if you are interested, uh, we are hiring. I'll put a, a link up at the end. Uh, so how do we get from that to the uh, topic of this talk? Um, well, I'm also uh, on the organizers of the Cambridge Programme Study Group. Uh, we meet up about once a week to uh, study topics in computer science. And about a year and a half ago, we were looking at machine learning, and in particular, uh, genetic algorithms, um, and how we could uh, use those to evolve some code. Um, so having managed to get that to work, I pretty much instantly became fairly concerned about my job security. Um, so if we think about it, over the course of history, uh, the kind of way we've lived our lives and the kind of work we've done has um, massively changed the result of technology. Um, so for instance, um, in agriculture, we used to have a large majority of the population working in the fields, sowing seeds, uh, harvesting crops. Um, we developed things like this, um, and now uh, we've kind of freed up most of us to work on other things. Um, a more recent example, I mean, you walk into a supermarket, I'm sure you've all seen rows of these self-checkouts where you might have had lots of people working at tills, now you can just have a single person uh, staffing these. Um, so you might think, okay, well that's quite repetitive work, things that are easy to automate, um, but increasingly uh, with artificial intelligence we're seeing um, even higher skilled uh, work um, coming to the firing line. Uh, so this is uh, IBM's Watson uh, machine. Uh, if you've not heard of this before, it was developed uh, a few years ago as a supercomputer to um, compete at the US quiz show Jeopardy. Uh, this is a contest in which the contestants are uh, given the answers and they have to respond with what the question was. Um, so figuring this out involves kind of a mixture of natural language processing, uh, having a big store of information or general knowledge that you kind of retrieve data from, and also kind of applying some machine learning techniques to figure out kind of connecting all this together. Uh, so this definitely uh, won at Jeopardy, it's uh, defeating the uh, champions, human champions at that. Um, um, and it's now been applied uh, to some other areas as well. So uh, we have things like medical diagnostics, uh, where there's a huge volume of information. So new clinical studies being published all the time, uh, journal entries, the patient's own medical history. Uh, this is a lot of data for a doctor to deal with when diagnosing a patient. Uh, this machine can instantly uh, have all the latest uh, journal articles, it, it can read them all in a time that a doctor simply wouldn't have and have all that information available to it. So it's potentially uh, able to make uh, more accurate diagnoses, particularly for uncommon conditions that a doctor may not have come across before in their working lives. Uh, you can also apply it to things like legal work, um, so preparing a case for a trial, you have lots of uh, prior judgments to trawl through, um, lots of legal studies, that kind of thing. Um, it can also be used as a teaching assistant in the classroom, so because of its natural language processing abilities, uh, it can understand questions that students are asking and come back to them with their answers. Um, so now we have people like doctors, lawyers, teachers, uh, also having their jobs coming into the firing line from this rise in technology. So what about our software developers then? So you might think, okay, hopefully we're okay, hopefully we're needed to write the code that makes this work. Um, but as I said, it's looking at ways that you could generate that code rather than write it yourself. Um, so how might you go about that? So one approach you could take um, is something called a genetic algorithm. Uh, so this is a type of guided random search algorithm. Um, so as opposed to um, a systematic search where you've got your kind of uh, data structure and you're going to look for it, this starting one end and going through until you find what you're looking for, or a random search where you might say, okay, I'm going to look over there, now over here, um, maybe over there again, have I found it yet? Nope. Uh, a guided random search is where you look in a few places and then based on what you find there, you make a decision as to where you should look next. So this makes some assumptions about the data being in some way sorted or continuous around the points of interest. Okay. And in particular, a genetic algorithm is a guided random search algorithm that takes inspiration from biology, um, particularly from evolution, uh, where we have this idea of natural selection, um, and that if you have some characteristic that makes you uh, more likely to survive, say you're quicker at running away from tigers or something like this, and we have survival of the fittest, you're more likely to pass on your genes to the next generation, and those features will get propagated. Uh, so how do we apply that uh, to a genetic algorithm then? Um, so if we take the example of evolving a string, so not programs yet, just, just a regular text string. So say we want to evolve one containing the title of this talk. Okay, so what we're going to do first is we're going to generate some initial uh, population of strings, so maybe 100 of them, 1,000 of them, just completely random strings, all different lengths, different characters. Um, 
We're then going to evaluate those and see how much they look like the target we're trying to get to. So this is where our analogy of evolution has somewhat completely gone out the window um, because we now have an end goal in mind um, and we're going to construct our fitness function um, so, so we are steering um, this algorithm towards reaching that. Okay. So having done that, uh, we're going to select um, which uh, members of this population should survive and pass on their genes. So which, which initial strings looked the most like the target? Okay, and naively, we might just say, we're going to take the half with the best fitness score, just the top half and throw the rest away. We're then going to cross them over. So this step is going to be analogous to you getting half your chromosomes from each parent. So again, a simple solution, we might just say, well, I'll take the first half of one string, second half of the other, and stick them together. Um, there is then a mutation step. So in the same way as some genes get randomly mutated during reproduction uh, to introduce new characteristics, uh, we're going to pick a random character in this string and then just change it to a different one. Okay, so we've now got a population consisting half of the fittest individuals from the previous round and half of their sort of children, as it were. Um, we want to now check, have we reached our target? If so, great, we can stop. If not, we're going to loop that round. Okay, and that's the general flow of it. So let's uh, try and run that then. Okay, so what we're going to see when we run this is that for each generation, we're going to print out some statistics about sort of the fitness scores that we've got, and we're going to print out uh, the best string that we've got in that generation, which to start with is probably going to just be something that's about the right length, because in a collection of random strings, that'll be the best. Okay, so as this goes, we should see some features start to emerge, the spaces go in the right places, uh, the characters get correct, and indeed, we've got to their talk title. Okay, so that's all well and good for strings, but now say so we want to evolve programs. Um, so there are some extra challenges here. Um, so whereas with string evolution, I could just dump some random characters into a string, and it's a valid string. It might not be very close to what I want, but it is a string. Uh, with program evolution, if I just put a load of random characters into a file, the odds that that's going to be a valid Python program, a valid C program, or what have you, are pretty slim. There's lots of rules about syntax and things that we're going to need to conform to. So you might think, OK, well, I'll have um, some templates. Like This thing looks vaguely like a four block, and it'll have some blanks, and I can fill those in. And I'll have templates for if statements and that sort of thing, and I'll combine them like that. And fair enough, you will generate your initial population will have lots of valid programs in, and that'll be fine. Um, but when you come to cross those over and to mutate them, you'll very quickly get back to invalid stuff again. So you might say, OK, well, to make crossover easy, I'll have my own language, and it'll just have a load of symbols, and you'll be able to put them in any order you like. Okay, and, and that, that might work. Uh, the problem you're going to have there is that we want to be able to program arbitrary things in this language that we're, we code that we're going to evolve in. We don't want to limit what we can create. Um, so what we need is for the language to be something called Turing complete, and the idea and um, the language that you kind of naively make may not be so. Um, so what do I mean um, by uh, by something being Turing complete? Okay, so. Alan Turing did a lot of work on the theory of computation, and in particular the idea of um, reprogrammable machines that could be used to compute arbitrary stuff. Uh, and so he came up with this concept of a Turing machine as a sort of model to think about this to help him mathematically reason about them. Uh, and all it is is it's an infinitely long piece of tape. It's divided up into a series of cells. Um, you have like an arrow that points at the cell that you currently look at, and you can move that arrow backwards and forwards. Um, and in each cell, you can put a symbol in there, you can read out the current symbol, or you can change the value of that symbol. That's all it is. Um, it's a very simple device, but it can be shown mathematically that anything that is computable, and not everything is, there are certain things that are mathematically impossible to compute, but if it is computable, it can be computed on this device. Okay. And when we say a language is Turing complete, all we mean is that it can be used to simulate one of, uh, any single taped Turing machine, aka anything that's computable, you can compute in that language. So it enables us to program whatever we like, basically. So those are our requirements then. We're looking for a language uh, that's very syntactically simple and it is Turing complete. Um, so at this point, I thought, well, that probably already exists. Um, let's not reinvent the wheel. So like any good developer, I Googled it. Um, came across uh, this site, uh, Corey Becker's site, primaryobjects.com. Um, this is a great site. She's got lots of articles on there about machine learning. Um, one of them was a project where she'd been working on pretty much exactly this problem, so evolving code rather than writing it. Um, so uh, what is this language used? Uh, so it's got only eight characters, um, and it's pretty much a model of a Turing machine. Um, so in the interest of not getting myself thrown out the conference for swearing repeatedly throughout the rest of the talk, I've left the name of it slightly as an exercise to the reader, but um, I'm sure you can guess. 
Um, so the first six characters are pretty much just a Turing machine. So this is moving the pointer backwards and forwards, changing the value at the cell, uh, reading it in, and reading it out, and, and putting a value in. The last two characters, the square braces, are where things get interesting. This is what gives us our control flow. So the ability to say, based on the value I've got here, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to keep looping, or I'm going to break out of that loop. So that's what allows us, gives us languages power. So what does a program in BrainF look like? Um, so this, for example, is Hello World. So your classic first program, just print Hello World to the screen. Um, as you can see, this is a fairly esoteric language. You wouldn't really want to write anything complicated in it, particularly when you get past just printing output. It gets rapidly quite complicated keeping track of what you're doing. You certainly wouldn't want to try and debug or maintain uh, any code written in this. Um, but to a computer, this is just as intelligible as, say, a piece of Python code, a piece of C code. Um, it's fine running this. And from our point of view, we already know how to generate strings. We already know how to cross them over, mutate them. And this is just a string. So we can apply all the same techniques. So let's try then and evolve a program uh, in this. Uh, so um, I was going to do uh, Hello World, but I realized there's probably not time uh, in this talk for that to converge on a solution. Uh, so we're just going to go for a slightly abbreviated one. It's just going to say hi. Okay. Um, so. Uh, what we're going to see is for each generation, we're going to print out the output of each program. And we're also going to print out um, the program string, the actual brain F code itself, um, for the, the best uh, individual in that, in that generation. Okay. Um, so we have some new issues to contend with here. Um, so we now have the potential to have an invalid program. So while BrainF has very few syntactical requirements, you do need to match up those square braces. So if those aren't matched, uh, the program's invalid. We also have the potential to time out, so we can have a valid program that gets stuck in an infinite loop. So we need some cutoff point after which we judge, yeah, this probably isn't going to finish, um, and class that as an error as well. Um, we also, because uh, real machines don't have infinite amount of memory, we have to use a finite length uh, tape rather than the model's infinite one. Um, so our program might go off the end of that memory, in which case, again, we need to notice that. So all of these cases, we spot, and we give them a very low fitness score, so we try and weed them out so they're not selected to the future generations. The next thing to note is that we get quite close to the target output um, and then don't seem to get very much further. So why is that? So unlike the string evolution, uh, where the thing we were evolving and the thing we were measuring its fitness of were one and the same, here we're measuring the fitness of the output, but we're actually evolving the program string. So while the output might be very close, it might require quite a big jump in the program code to get to where we want. So it might be stuck in a slightly awkward loop or require quite a big mutation. Okay, and so to try and help with that, we've increased uh, the number of types of mutation we allow. So rather than just having uh, replacement, uh, you can now sort of have mutations that insert random characters or delete them. Um, and in terms of the replacement one, rather than just being a single character that we might flip, we're kind of going to go over the whole program string and maybe change any of those. We also need to change our selection uh, metric. So if we just selected the top half, um, that would be a bit too elitist. We'd be very narrowly driving towards something that looked like the output to start with, and sort of cutting off avenues that didn't look so promising originally, but would come back around. Um, so what we want is some chance to include those uh, individuals with lower fitness score um, so that we can increase our chance of getting out of these local minimum we're stuck in. Um, so what we're going to do is rather than selecting the top half, we're going to have sort of like a roulette wheel spinner. So if you imagine like a pie chart uh, where the size of each wedge um, is going to be uh, bigger if this individual has a higher fitness score. Uh, and then we're going to spin it and sort of select ones. So lower fitness individuals may still be selected, but with a lower probability. And so hopefully we will then actually get to the solution. Uh, running a random demo is, is a bit of fun on... Ooh, that's fun. Uh, a, bit, a bit of fun on a... Um, uh, presentation. Um, one thing you will notice is that some of these programs are quite suboptimal, so you'll see lots of pluses in a row followed by lots of minuses. Um, so clearly there's things that we could do to make that ah, more efficient. So we have high, so we have our program. Um, this is good. Uh, so it's worth saying that this can be taken further, so um, Corey Becker she took this and she made uh, evolved programs that generate the first few, few, uh, first few Fibonacci numbers or that took user input and added those numbers up. Um, so more interesting things can be done. Um, I think it might also be quite interesting to, uh, rather than evolving BrainF programs, to say take the um, abstract syntax tree of Python and try and uh, evolve that and see if you get that to work. Um, so I certainly did some stuff with function evolution, uh, modeling those as trees, and that did work. So I think that could, uh, could work. So um, if you're interested, all the uh, code for this talk is up on GitHub. Um, I uh, hope you found it interesting. Uh, I'd like to thank, again, uh, Cambridge Medical Robotics for enabling me to be here and give you this talk. Um, as I said, we are hiring. 
Um, so if you too would like to work with knife folding robots, it does make you sound quite interesting at parties, and in all seriousness is um, very rewarding work, potential to save some lives. Um, and we're interested in Python developers, uh, software test engineers, um, if there are any embedded C developers in the room, or if you could do any of those, it'd be great, more than one, even better. Um, but yeah. Um, anyway. All right, thank you very much, Emma. Do we have any questions? Hey, thanks. Uh, so you're generating a lot of pro lots of programs and then running them. Is there any danger of this doing anything weird on your, I don't know, like on your computer or I don't know what's included in this Supreme F library? in terms of APIs, what it can do on your system? Uh, yes, yeah, it can do arbitrary things, so it could potentially do, do anything. Um, yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> um. Any more questions? Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, so. What I got from this is that uh, you sort of evolve a search space and you set the software to find it. Now, in the highest, uh, the high version, probably it wasn't very, very efficient, but like performance wise, would you sort of go for this in order to make like go also evolve programs or go further? I mean, that do you have proof that these genetic algorithms really are worth dealing, I mean, going deeper into that? So I didn't quite hear that. Was that a have question you, have about? Have you actually tried it somewhere? Was that a question about how you could make the performance better? I didn't quite hear. No, it's like, do you have an, any actual sort of scenario where you have tried this and you got a better result than just writing code on your own? Sorry, I still can't quite hear you. Um, have I tried Should, it? Shall I speak louder? Uh, do you have an actual scenario where you have used this, like a real life? Oh, uh, in real life. Um, Probably not. It was mainly for sort of uh, fun and interest sake, uh, educational value of trying it out. Um, I, mean, I guess if you could improve the form of search so it worked better, then yeah, why not? Um, certainly if for some reason you wanted to write um, Brain F programs, um, I don't want to have to write those and this can certainly write them uh, quicker than I can. Um, so for dealing with something like that, then yes, this would be better, but like, kind of why, why would you do that normally? Um, but I think it's certainly interesting um, more from a sort of academic point of view of kind of what could you do um, if you push the boundaries of this rather than any um, practical applications right now. Hi, great talk. Uh, are you using generic algorithms for robotics development? Are you using them for what? Uh, yes. um, generic algorithms for robotics, yes. Ah, okay, no, um, no, I'm not using them at work at the moment. Um, this was just a, a side project. Um, yeah, I think uh, when it comes to surgical robots, we um, probably want them to be slightly more deterministic, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Have you ever experimented with evolving the syntax tree of the program instead of the text representation? Maybe this is much more efficient, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I, I haven't tried that. Um, it's one of the questions uh, that came up when I gave this talk at uh, PyCon UK last year, and certainly I think that would be a really interesting uh, thing to do with this. Um, so we did look at function evolution, um, so evolving polynomial functions, which model as trees in kind of a, a similar way that you would have uh, abstract syntax tree, and that did work for evolving them. So I think you could definitely do it. Um, quite tempted to try. Any more questions? Oh, uh, hi. Is there uh, any specific reason that you use genetic algorithm instead of any other optimization techniques? Um, not particularly. So we were just studying a range of different topics in machine learning, and this happened to be the one that I was doing at the time, uh, which is uh, why I use this. Um, I'm not, not for an instance saying that this is necessarily the most uh, optimal way of, of doing this, um, but it was just interesting. Really. All right, if there are no more questions. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Hey, 
why wouldn't you use uh, genetic algorithms or any kind of algorithms for, for the robots? Because, I mean, we have self-driving cars that kind of go in that direction. I mean, I understand that you want uh, deterministic behavior, but uh, I guess you could achieve good results. Um, so why would you use them in general? I'm, I think if you're, they're a useful search algorithm. So um, if, if you have, uh, like I said, data that is in some way uh, sorted so that you can tell from looking in, in one area if the thing next to it might be quite useful, it can be a more efficient way to su search a, a large space. Um, I don't think you would, uh, I'm not aware anyway of any applications for self-driving cars, but I think it's more kind of searching large amounts of data that it might uh, come to play. Okay, right. It's lunchtime, everybody. Thank you very much.